Good morning and welcome to To The Point. This week, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, along with the heads of the Michigan State Police and the Michigan Department of Transportation, called a press event. They wanted to talk about the wicked winter weather. Not just this winter storm that has been passing through, but what's going to happen when all that snow starts to melt. It's going to create some real problems, and the state wants to be prepared. Here's some of what they had to say. So this is a situation where we want to be precautionary, particularly with respect to potential flooding challenges and other challenges related to, again, high winds and freezing temperatures again with a lot of water out there. So it's something we want to give people a heads up and make sure we're prepared. We're already taking a number of actions. It's great to have um, Colonel Etchew, the Director of Michigan State Police, with me and Director Steidel from the Michigan Department of Transportation. But we've actually had discussions with a number of department heads on this topic already today. Um, in preparation. So again, we don't want to assume winter's over with in terms of winter weather, in terms of snow and other conditions such as that. So depending on what part of the state you live, we want to really get people an alert to say Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, to add extra precautions and protections with respect to these weather conditions. Now more specifically when you talk about some of these things, if we get into flooding situations, um, again, obvious things we ask people to look at, if you see a flooded street, if you know a street's flooded, please don't drive on it. Um, too often people can get stuck and run into other issues in flooded streets. Uh, if you have a situation where you have storm drains, eaves troughs, uh, downspouts, other things, you may want to be out there today to see if they're in a condition where they're actually transporting water instead of being backed up. MDOT's making a real effort at cleaning storm drains on our highways and other places to see what we can do to deal with that situation. Uh, we've actually had contact between the DNR, the DEQ, the Corps of Engineers, and the Coast Guard about some of our rivers and what conditions and making sure we're monitoring those appropriately. Again, this is a situation where a lot of this is being smart about these situations. So again, it's the good neighbor policy. If you know someone that has more challenges because of age or other conditions, can you help them out? to get through situations like this in terms of clearing drains or being prepared. If you have a sump pump, can you, you may want to make sure that sump pump's working in terms of draining water. Uh, the list goes on of normal preparations like this we need to be thoughtful of and helpful with. Um, one I would add that we ran across is if you think you are worried about having freeze up on your roof with everything going out, please be thoughtful before you get out the ladder and simply put the ladder on the ground because one, it's soft ground, it could be icy, and going up on a roof during the middle of winter is not something you should consider lightly um, in terms of actions to take. So we're just trying to stay on top of things and get ahead of things in terms of making sure people are alert and aware. Uh, we do have a website that we'd recommend people look to for weather conditions and other um, particular information with respect to flooding. Um, that's michigan.gov um, backslash EMHSD which stands for Emergency Management and Homeland Security Division. Um, one continuous improvement item, we're coming up with a catchier title to put on that, so it'll be easier for you to remember. So a lot of this is, again, this is not old news, this is new news, but let's be prepared, let's be smart, let's help one another as good neighbors, as good Michiganders, and understand that this is a record winner, both in terms of cold, snow, and other conditions, and let's get through it. We've had, uh, actually, uh a, a statewide conversation with our maintenance crews about getting all the equipment prepped so that we make sure that the generators are all working, the pumps are all working, the chainsaws are working because there's going to be trees that move through uh, so that when this um, the, the flooding starts to occur we aren't looking around for where's the gas can and uh, the reports from all of our areas across the state is they're ready and they're uh, able to go. I would ask that, that people uh, would look to the local uh, roads that they're on, culverts, bridges. We'll see ice dams as the, the uh, rivers and, and little streams begin to break apart. The ice will collect at the bridges. That can cause a dam of water. And uh, if anybody sees those, we would like them to call their local road authority. So call a local road commission, call the city, call MDOT, call one of those and let somebody know about that ice dam. Uh, we have people out looking, but that would certainly uh, be very appreciative to have an extra set of eyes. Those ice dams, as they push against bridges, can ultimately push a bridge off of its foundation. So it's very important that we get at those uh, right away. Uh, and then um, 
Lastly, I'd like to just reiterate what the Colonel said. If there's standing water, please be careful driving through it. In fact, don't. Uh, you don't know what the pavement is like below it. It could be a crater that is now uh, it will engulf your car. Uh, it could be deep, and it could st stall your car out. So please don't drive through uh, open water. I want to give a shout out to the, the members of both their organizations and the other local law enforcement, public safety, and road commission people. They've been working a lot of hours this winter, working very hard. So thanks to all the teams for being out there to try to keep people safe and do all that hard work. Um, again, this is a record winter in terms of cold, snow, and uh, we still have more to come. Have you had any estimates from any of your experts if there is any particular part of the state? I know that we've all got a lot of snow and the rain is going to be generalized, but are there any certain areas that you're looking at either from you know, your perspective or some of the emergency management folks that you're more concerned about than others? Uh, well, we're still not through winter, Rick, but to go to your point, again, I think based on last year in particular, but prior years, the flooding issue is a concern because we've seen that really be a concern on certain rivers and waterways in our state. So we need to be very attuned to that. But I think in many respects, the record winter and the record cold has hit most of us. I think there were some good articles recently just showing the, the amount of snowfall all, all across the state. I think if you they had a number in Marquette, I believe that was almost 120 inches already. And I believe the Detroit number is, is the third snowiest winter in history, going, and I'm going back to 18-something. Uh, last year, as you're aware, in Grand Rapids, we had flooding that was near historic levels and challenged pretty mightily the flood restraint walls that we have in the city. There, there's a much larger snowpack on right now, and even though it is going to get cold again, we're not going to see it all melt at once. Have you been in contact with anybody in Grand Rapids in your emergency preparedness and had any discussions about that? Um, I think our team's been talking to people statewide across the state, talking to all the local officials that we can, because this is a concern not just at the state. We've seen a lot of concern from local jurisdictions. So that's part of the dialogue we need to have. And, again, hopefully we won't have a repeat of the issues on the, the Grand River like we did last year. That was close, within a couple feet of being a major challenge, and it was a problem to begin with. And, of course, perhaps the biggest issue when the snow is finally gone, when the roads are finally dry, will be just how big those potholes will be. And what about that billion dollars that the governor wants every year for the next 10 to fix those kind of problems? Well, coming up next, we'll talk to a state senator who says he might agree with the governor. They need more money, but where will that money come from? That's next. To the point. Welcome back to To The Point. Just moments ago, you heard Governor Snyder and the head of the Michigan Department of Transportation talk about the problems that we'll be facing with roads this spring. There is a proposal that you no doubt have heard about to spend an extra billion or more a year on Michigan roads for the next 10 years. And it is an idea that many people have embraced. Problem is, where do you get that billion extra dollars? That's one of the things we talked with Senator Stephen Bita about. Senator, let's start by talking about roads. This past week you just voted on a supplemental that will put another $100 million, if agreed to by the uh, House and signed off on by uh, the governor, that would be largely for snow removal, uh, mostly for state, but some municipalities as well. You voted in favor. I was supportive of the amendment. I was supportive of the proposal. In fact, if uh, we, we had some support to go a little bit higher, I would have gone a little higher. I could see the, the need for it in my local communities. I could see as I travel around the state the need for that. Uh, certainly our local communities have been devastated by this uh, unpredictable and extreme weather conditions we've had this winter. Um, our local units of government are, are suffering, but also so are our drivers, so are people that are going in these roads. And Just yesterday my executive assistant had a, hit a pothole and she's looking at over $500 in repairs to her car. Um, it's, a, it's a public safety issue, uh, it's an economic issue. Uh, we need to address that. And there is the much larger issue that the governor has talked about now for at least three years, two and a half mm -hmm. years anyway, uh, talking about that extra billion plus dollars he would like to see invested over a 10 year period. That's a big chunk of money to invest just in roads and infrastructure, bridges and elsewhere, mm -hmm. and even some public transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, but the conversation in Lansing has evolved. It started out with some people saying, well, I don't know, to now what appears to this observer, a majority of people saying, well, yeah, I think we do need to spend that money. But now the conversation is, where would it come from? First of all, are you in favor of trying to spend that kind of money on the long term? And if so, 
Where does it come from? Well, first of all, I, I recognize the need, I recognize the problem, and I recognize the fact that we need to do something. And I, I support where the governor has, has, has talked about as far as addressing the issue. Now, some of the nuts and bolts and how we're going to pay for it, that's where a lot of people fall off on the train. There's a lot of different ideas on where we can go from it. Frankly, we're talking about a little bit of a budget surplus this next year. I'd like to see a good chunk of that devoted towards roads. I think it's a one-time uh, phenomena that we're going to have in our budget, but we can take care of a lot of existing problems with that and I think that would be good not only for public safety, not only for improving the roads, but also be good for the economy because there's a lot of jobs that would, would result from those repairs. Um, also, frankly, I, de I deal with groups that are looking to invest in, in Michigan all the time and when they come here and they look at our roads, it's a big detriment, it's a big turnoff. They look at our roads and they're, they're, they're less than, than a lot of third world countries have. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about bringing jobs and investment into the state and we can't even maintain our roads properly. We need to do something. I agree with the governor that it's a problem. I uh, look forward to working with him and, and others, both on my side of the aisle and the other side of the aisle, to come up with a solution. There is a certain irony that Michigan, which is the home of the automobile makers in the United States, has the road conditions that are really tough on the automobiles that we make. It's, uh, it's actually one of the most amazing things, and I've had people actually remark that they've come from other countries and say, wow, this is the Motor City, this is where you make cars, and um, you have some of the worst roads we've ever seen. Uh, Definitely, it's ironic a situation. I know it's not up to you alone uh, when it comes to that kind of funding. A billion dollars is a considerable amount of money, mm -hmm. even for a state like Michigan, and mm -hmm. has a $52 billion mm -hmm. budget, roughly. Uh, a lot of that, I should say, is federal money that comes back mm -hmm. through, and it isn't really disposable to the degree that you can just move it from one place to the other. Exactly. But this would be... Uh, in the minds of many, revenue that would have to be generated. Are you of the mind that you have to find a revenue generation mechanism if you come up with that, or do you think that there's money that exists within the budget now? Uh, I think it's a combination of both. I think there's some money that exists in the budget now that we could we could reallocate to to roads and to bridges. I think some of it we need to find a more uh, stable funding source. Um, the reliance on the gas tax, I think, is something that we need to to uh, to reexamine, particularly as we're also encouraging policies to move to electric cars and hybrid vehicles, which really don't bring the revenue in but still use the roads. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of different creative responses to that. I think we need to look at those in the totality and see the dollars that they would raise. Uh, also recognize that some of the proposals to, to address the road issue is rather regressive and falls disproportionately on, on people of more limited means. I would look to look something that's a little bit more fair when we're dealing with that issue. I assume by the more regressive type of revenue you would think of that in terms of the uh, expansion of the registration cost by $100? Yeah, I think the registration cost is a non-starter. I think that's just too big of a, of a hit. And, uh, but I do think there's some other areas that we could take a look at that might make more sense. When you talk to your colleagues, and, and I should point out that in the Senate, perhaps a little bit more in the House, mm -hmm. uh, you talk to a lot of folks across the aisle because mm -hmm. you've served with a lot of them when you were in the House, mm -hmm. and so uh, you all have a better relationship, not better uh, quantitatively, but, but better from the standpoint you've known each other longer. Yeah, it, and it's definitely been helpful to have that working relationship. But when you think about it in terms of anybody that works in any type of work environment, having that opportunity to know your coworkers and work with them and understand where they're coming from, uh, it's a lot better than that new person that starts in the office and people are trying to figure that out. So it does make it a little bit, uh, and you also know where their talents lie and their interests lie. So it's a, it's a much easier process, I think, than, uh, than dealing with a lot of new people. So as you talk with some of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, some Republicans, do you hear them working through these same plans, these same ideas? Is, is, there, is there an effort, on a bipartisan effort, to try to come to that solution for a billion dollars? Or a lot of them saying, we don't even want to start this? Well, it's a, it's a mix. There are definitely some that, that see it as an as a unmet need in the state, and then there are some that, well, we'd like to see the roads fixed, but we'd like to see them just kind of organically do it themselves. They don't want to touch anything that, that has a hint of a tax uh, increase or any type of revenue implications that way. It's, in my opinion, not a very mature attitude to look at because, frankly, as we all know in our own everyday lives, um, nothing comes for free. And so if we want to fix the roads, they're going to have to find a way of paying for them. Now, finding a way of paying for them that's not disproportionate on one group or another and that's fair, that's the little harder part of the mix. Uh, I don't want to make you a fortune teller or to get out your crystal ball, but 
if something like this were to happen, if Republicans could come up with votes they needed and presumably they wouldn't want to do it without a few Democratic votes, mm -hmm. is this something that is more likely to happen after the election than before? Um, my suspicion is it's probably more likely to happen after an election than before an election. Uh, there is a certain um, uh, you know, paranoia that uh, candidates have and people seeking re-election may have on, on this issue. Um, but I do think as citizens we have to keep our, our elected officials feet to the fire. Um, I, I think it's important to go over and do these things. And I think also, to be honest with you, I think it's good policy and I think the, the electorate also notices that too. Not doing anything is just as bad as, as maybe doing something that might have some controversy to it. There is an issue that we will revisit and I suspect you and I will talk about again, but there's another issue that we may actually deal with on Election Day, and that is the minimum wage in this state. I know mm -hmm. that there is a big effort to collect signatures, get ballot language, all of the things we've talked about. Uh, if I understand it, the most recent proposal by the group that is trying to get this on the ballot would raise the minimum wage to $10.10 an mm -hmm. hour. Tell me about your thoughts on raising the minimum wage. First of all, is it a good idea? Well, in, in, the, in its uh, general sense, yes, I think it, it is a good idea. We see a, a number of studies by economists that it puts more money in the economy, lifts more people out of poverty, and we're dealing with some of the essential uh, costs of living that have gone up so tremendously. Uh, it does make some sense. No, it's like everything else. It's what's the magic number. Uh, and I think we look at different economists' uh, uh, numbers on it, and it's somewhere between 9 and $10 uh, an hour. Um, there's a, also a split between the tipped wage and the regular minimum wage, and it's a little bit more complicated to go into it that way. But um, it, it looks to me that uh, all the studies I've seen that it actually would benefit the economy. Now, I also understand the position of those that say, well, it might cost jobs or it might make things more expensive. But when you start to pull down the hourly rate of some of our minimum workers, and particularly those who work in full time on minimum wage, um, you know, they, they barely can barely are above poverty level at, at this point in time, and so it's something that I think we need to address. That is an interesting discussion because if you put somebody in a 40-hour week minimum wage job right now, it's very difficult to see how they're going to make ends meet. But the question is, is the answer to raise the minimum wage or is the answer finding jobs that pay better than minimum wage? In other words, are, are entry-level jobs or minimum wage jobs the path for people to have a, a full-time employment in existence. Well, in the meantime, they have to make a living. Right. They have to pay their bills. They have to pay the heating bills. They have to pay their doctor bills. They have to make a living. And, and having people that just are working full-time and coming in under the poverty level, uh, probably not good for our economy. And we see studies by economists that uh, the CBO, the report that came out about a week ago, said it would lift out an increase in the minimum wage at the federal level would lift over a million people out of poverty. I mean, that's a pretty significant number. Now, there's a different ways of chopping numbers on that, too, and I could see from a perspective of a business, perhaps, that, that raising that wage uh, minimally might cost them um, profits. They have to raise some prices in some areas. But if we have a uniform level, their competitors will have to do the same thing, so would everybody else. So I think overall it'll help create um, and keep better paying jobs and help people make those, those bills. You know, frankly, when you put more money into the economy, particularly people who are, are just making by, uh, it's going to add a lot to the economy as well because there would be more dollars flowing in there. One union group uh, supporting this idea put out uh, a survey this past week of five battleground states, and that is states that they identified where the governor's races would be battles. Michigan was one of them. They didn't break it down by state, but overall, raising the minimum wage polled very, very well with the people that they talked to in those states. So in addition to being an issue that you see as a matter of economic fairness, it's also a pretty good political issue for, for uh, some folks out there, obviously, because it's polling, according to that poll, well above 60%. I haven't seen the poll, so I can't, I can't comment on that. But uh, whenever you have something like that that might poll well and, and it's something that might be on one side or the other of the political spectrum, um, it probably does help benefit that party. In your opinion, again, one more time, making the, uh, uh, the judgment about what happens in November, uh, is this going to be a successful effort to get this on the ballot? Uh, well, you know, it, there's, a, there's a threshold requirement for signatures. I don't know what kind of background that they have and, and what type of resources are behind it because it's, uh, um, it always looks like 
whenever you have a ballot initiative, it's okay, this is going to be pretty easy to put together until you start actually doing it. So it's going to have to have some resources behind it and a lot of people behind it. Um, I think there's some popularity behind it, so I suspect that if it, if it does have enough circulars out there that they'll collect those signatures to put it on the ballot, I think people actually like to vote on, on things of that nature. Uh, and sometimes they want to vote against it. They might sign the, the proposal to say, no, this is something that we're opposed to, but I think we need to have a public discussion about it. Um, I just don't know what kind of money is going to be behind it. And so there will be people, so let me try to explain, and you correct me where I'm wrong here. Uh, people say, well, what, what do you need money for? You just send people out and they collect signatures. But this is typically done with people who ha know how to do this, who are mm -hmm. hired to do this, mm -hmm. and who are paid by signature. And that's what right. you mean, it, where it gets expensive. Yeah, that's, that's the, uh, you know, there's mailing costs, even if you're mailing sure. out these circulars to people. Um, there's also just just getting the advertisement out there that this is out there, um, but but also generally speaking, most of the successful ones have had paid circulars or people that are doing this full time, because uh, it's 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 a fairly large threshold in a fairly short period of time for them to collect those. And we will do a whole segment one day soon about how it works, but just so people understand, mm -hmm. you can't just go to big populous areas and do it. It has to be scattered around the state. It has to be representative from elections previous. So this is not, even though we have seen a fair number of these things make the ballot, it's not a simple process for it. No, it's not. It's actually probably easier in Michigan than it is other states. Uh, which is another issue that I think we need to address at some point, uh, you know, particularly constitutional amendments. But I do think uh, there's enough of a threshold there that it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to put on the ballot. You and I have talked over the years a number mm -hmm. of times when you were in the House. Now that you're over in the Senate, we've talked. Give me your general impression of where we are, because this is a much different town than it was when Jennifer Granholm was over mm -hmm. in the Romney building and Democrats were in control over in the House, Republicans controlled both chambers, they got a Republican uh, in uh, the governor's office. Uh, what is it like coming to work every day now as, as a Democrat? Well, you know, there's a, there's a saying, the more things change, the more they remain the same. There's a certain similarity in, in a lot of different things. One thing, you see a lot of the same people. Um, you know, certainly bureaucracy doesn't change, the same people are there, uh, and that's actually that one unelected segment of our population that has significant power in Lansing. Um, you know, I, I think there's a certain amount of partisanship that goes on here, but I think sometimes um, the perception of the public is it's much sharper than it, than it actually is. There's actually a lot of things that we're able to work together on and we do, but sometimes there are those, those, those tipping points where both sides have their disagreements and we come to loggerheads on that. Um, but coming to work, uh, it's, it's really an honor. I, 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 I can tell you that every day I, I see something new in this place, not only the building but the people that, that my life gets touched by. Um, I had a, a family come in from my district yesterday, and they had a, a little five-year-old boy who's suffering from some rare disorder, and uh, it, it had to deal with uh, medical treatment. And I was really touched by their story, um, but I was also looking at ways of how we do, how we address things legislatively, and uh, very earnest coming, just citizen lobbyist coming to talk with their legislator, and uh, I, I never, I never cease to have a certain amount of awe at our system that has this type of representative democracy and that have people come and speak to their legislators as to issues of their importance. And it's really important. And that thing never changes. I don't care what party is in power. Our thanks to the senator for talking with us this week. And he brought up an interesting point that we will talk about next to the point. Among other things, Senator Stephen Bita talked about cooperation in the House and Senate and talked about how it's actually more common than you might think by watching some of our broadcasts. On that point, he's right. There is a fair amount of bipartisan cooperation in both the House and the Senate. But it is on big issues and very often money issues where there are big, big differences. And of course, that does make news. We'll continue to follow what's going on in Lansing when it comes to the roads and more as the budget process moves on. And we'll be back here next Sunday morning. I hope you'll join us. To the point.